Sagawalk, Wazasti, and the rest of the Seaway Valley. Good morning and welcome to a live edition of Seaway on Wednesday to Wazala. My name is Reen Cook. And uh, original air day of the program today is uh, Tuesday, April 20th, 2021. We have a reminder that views and opinions expressed by our guests and our callers during Nidawatala, not necessarily those of 97.3 CKLN or the Aquazaste Communication Society. Mohawk Council of Aquazaste Grand Chief Abram Benedict joining us today to provide a monthly update on behalf of the Mohawk Council of Aquazaste. And we will talk about some different uh, avenues that MCA uh, has been taking with regards to the vaccine rollout and also with regards to the testing. We'll talk about VOCs and a number of items uh, regarding uh, the Ontario uh, shutdown as well and how that affects the Mohawk Council of Aquazaste. So we've got a lot of uh, information to pass along here today. And the way that we do the program is if you have questions for the Grand Chief, you have to call them into the radio station to get them on the air. 518-358-3427, 613-575-2101. Our operators are standing by to take your question down. I will ask it for you. We'll also let you know that uh, once the Grand Chief starts his presentation, he will uh, continue through the end of his presentation, and then we'll open up uh, to questions uh, that I have or that community members have phoned in. Once again, we'd like to remind you, the only way to get your question to the Grand Chief is by calling the radio station. We realize that uh, this uh, interview is being uh, uh, put on Facebook Live for the Mohawk Council of Aquazaste, but you won't be able to get your question into us uh, if you try and put it on the comment uh, section of the Facebook Live. So we want to make sure that that's absolutely clear. Uh, so with that, uh, we are going to turn now to the Mohawk Council of Aquazaste at Grand Chief. Abram Benedict, uh, welcome back to the airwaves for the monthly update under the jurisdiction of MCA. Sago and welcome, Grand Chief. Sago, Reen, and uh, Sago, and good afternoon to everyone. I hope you are all doing, continuing to do it well at this time. As always, Yama to Reen and CKON for providing time for me to update the community today. As mentioned for today's discussion, I'll be providing an update on our COVID-19 vaccine rollout. And I will also speak about the current restrictions uh, that we have in our community and around our community. We are grateful that many community members throughout all of Akwesasne have chosen to receive the COVID-19 vaccine. This is the best way to stop the spread in our community. To date, we have a total of 1,245 people have been vaccinated by the Mohawk Council of Akwesasne with many more residents having received the vaccine through the services provided by the St. Regis Mohawk tribe. We held a walk-in vaccine clinic on April 15, 16, and 17 at the Enola Go Arena. And at that time, we were able to vaccinate 273 people over the three days. I wanna give a big shout out to Nyamagoa to the Red Cross and all MCA employees who stepped up to assist with these clinics. It's important that we as a community continue to vaccinate as many community members as possible in order to reach our herded immunity or population immunity. Again, this happens when a population becomes immune through immunization or through previous infection, which we definitely prefer that our community uh, become immune uh, through taking uh, the vaccine, through, through receiving the vaccine rather than being infected. It has been reported that 70 to 90% of the population needs to be vaccinated in order for the herded immunity to be effective. MCA continues to work hard to ensure that all community members who want to be vaccinated will be vaccinated. While it's great that the number of community members getting the vaccine continues to rise, we want that to continue. We need everyone to be aware that the safety protocols must continue to be followed throughout this process and at least until we reach the population herded immunity. It's important that everyone understand that getting the first dose for this vaccine is not the end goal. It just starts the timer towards the vaccine being effective. It will take 42 days from the date of the first dose, first dose of vaccine to reach the 95% effectiveness. Once the initial vaccine injection is given, it is followed by the booster injection, which is given 28 days later. 
It's important that everyone receive the first dose followed by the scheduled booster, which is the second dose, in order to reach the optimal effectiveness of 95%. This happens two weeks after you receive the booster. Followed by the, following the schedule will ensure that you, re, you achieve the 95% effectiveness, which is 42 days from the first day from the first dose received. This is when you are considered uh, fully vaccinated. At this time, it is unclear whether or not an annual booster shot will be required. For now, we want as many community members as possible to get fully vaccinated, and we will wait for the medical experts to make the determination on whether or not we're required an annual booster. It is incredibly important for everyone to understand that even after you've been fully vaccinated, you must still continue to wash your hands frequently, wear a mask in public, and maintain a two meter distance from others when in public and avoid physical gatherings with anyone outside of your household. As a community, we have done so very well and we want to do even better. There is a, there is a number of vaccine clinics coming up within, within our community without an appointment needed. On Wednesday, April 21st, we'll be hosting at the Ganadigal Recreation from 2.30 to 6. Friday, April 23rd at the Nolago Arena from 9 till 11 a.m and Saturday, April 24th at the Gisleine Recreation Center from 12 till three. As for the restrictions within the Northern portion of Akwesasne, the community curfew continues to be in effect from 11 p.m. to 5 a.m. and the 100 mile, 160 kilometer travel radius remains in place as well. Anyone arriving from or returning to Akwesasne from outside of the travel radius for any non-essential reasons must quarantine for the 14 days. Since my last report, there have been a number of changes made in Ontario regarding the restrictions. On, on March 19th, the city of Ottawa moved into the red zone status to restrict and control the spread of COVID-19. This further limited social gatherings and the maximum capacities for businesses. On March 29th, the Eastern Ontario Health Unit, which includes the northern portion of Akwesasne, was also moved into the red zone. At that time, the MCA announced that we, would be, what, that we would be closing to the public for non all essential services for non essential services for at least until April 12th. On April 3rd, a four week provincial wide emergency break order was issued by the Premier of Ontario, which became in effect due to the number of COVID-19 cases in the province, which have been primarily caused by the variants of concern, also known as VOCs. MCA announced that we would close to the public for non-essential services until at least May 3rd. On April 8th, a four-week provincial-wide stay-at-home order was issued by the Premier of Ontario. The number of COVID-19 cases have continued to rise in Ontario at an alarming rate. Due to the more deadly and contagious variants of concern, hospitals throughout Ontario are reaching capacity in, in, as well in their ICU units. These admissions to the ICUs have already surpassed the worst case scenario that was predicted. The public is advised to stay at home unless you must leave for essential, unless you need to travel for essential reasons. The hope is that 40% of all adults in Ontario will be vaccinated by the end of the four week order. It is essentially a race between infections and, and, and infections and being immunized at which this point right now in Ontario, the infections or the VOCs are winning. Despite the already dire situation that exists, health experts are predicting that we have not yet reached the peak of this third wave. Finally, on April 17th, this past Saturday, Ontario again announced some stricter enforcements as part of the stay at home order and tightened restrictions took, took, took place as well. They have prohibited all outdoor social gatherings with the exception of those who live in your same household. All non-essential construction has been halted and in-store capacity limits have been lowered to 25%. All outdoor recreational amenities, golf courses, basketball nets, or basketball courts, soccer fields and playgrounds are also closed. And no one should be away from their residence except for essential purposes, such as purchasing groceries, attending work, taking care of your medical needs or exercising. As well, provincial travel is restricted between Ontario and Quebec and between Ontario and Manitoba. 
police checkpoints have been set up. Although the rates within Akwesasne are currently low, the original COVID-19 virus and the variants of concern are rapidly spreading in other areas around us, and we must do everything to keep our community safe. There are now three variants of concern, VOCs, present within Ontario. These VOCs are mutations of the original COVID-19 virus, and they exist due to the extensive circulation of the original virus throughout the world. The, the more a virus circulates, the more opportunity it has to change or mutate. The VOCs are generally based, their names are based on where they were first identified. The VOCs present in Ontario include the United Kingdoms or the UK, South African and the Brazil variant. The South African variant has also been found in our community. These VOCs spread faster, causing greater severity of the disease and raise concerns with the effectiveness of the vaccine. Ontario has reported that over the past two weeks, COVID cases have consistently been on the rise and that 70% of the most recent cases have been attributed to the VOCs. The VOCs are much higher, are a much higher risk than the original and they're leading to a higher hospital admission, higher ICU admissions and a higher rate of death. The VOCs are affecting younger people as well. These factors are the reasons why much stronger public health measures have been put in place. It is important for our health of our community and the community all around us that everyone adheres to the restrictions that have been put in place. The number of people currently in the ICU of Ontario hospitals is alarming. Despite planning ahead, the current modeling supports the extreme concerns being felt in Ontario right now. We need to flatten the curve again as this third wave hasn't even reached its peak. The intent for these much tighter restrictions is to allow for hospitals to keep up with the current demands and not let the demand become overwhelming to the point where it's overwhelming the healthcare system and to get many, many more people vaccinated. The current situation needs to, need, needs to get turned around. We don't want it to get worse. Flattening the curve over the next four to six weeks and greatly increasing the number of people fully vaccinated is the only way that we will be able to enjoy our summer. The Cornwall Community Hospital needs our help as well to stop the spread of COVID-19 and the VOCs. On April 17, 2021, the Cornwall Community Hospital reported that they had 18 total active COVID-19 patients with six in ICU and two staff members were confirmed as COVID positive as well. However, the hospital has clarified things a bit more. In line with Ontario's health guidelines, patients are considered inactive 14 days after the onset of COVID-19 symptoms since they are no longer considered contagious. However, a patient has been admitted then a patient that has been admitted then later gets labeled as inactive, but this does not mean that they do not require additional health care health care. For many, after the 14 day period has passed, they still require significant medical care. So there are many more cases at the hospital receiving care, whether they are included in the, the daily projections or daily reports. The data shows that COVID VOC infections inv infects individuals are 60% more likely to be hospitalized, twice as likely to get admitted to the, IOC, the, the, the ICU, excuse me, and 60% more likely to die compared to the previous COVID-19 strain. Patients in their 20s have been admitted to the Cornwall Community Hospital and the ICU due to the VOCs. The elderly and those with pre-existing conditions are no longer the only victims. The VOCs are not the only problem right now. People are generally frustrated, frightened, and fatigued, and there is no and there is a reason to be. However, we all need to follow the safety protocols that have been in place. Please continue to wash your hands frequently, wear a mask, and maintain the two meter distance from others when in public. Avoid the physical gatherings with anyone outside of your household, and only travel for the essential purposes and then within the 100 mile, 160 kilometer travel radius. And please respect our community curfew, which is 11 p.m. to the 5 a.m. and quarantine when asked to do so, so that you can protect all of us in our community. We must all continue to work hard to keep ourselves and each other safe. 
Reem, that is everything I wanted to cover in this afternoon's report. I am open to taking questions from you and the community. All right, again, we're talking with uh, Mohawk Council of Aquazase Grand Chief, Abram Benedict, and he's providing the monthly update uh, from the Mohawk Council of Aquazase. If you have a question for the Grand Chief, 518-358-3427, 613-575-2101. The only way to get your question to the Grand Chief is by calling the radio station. You can't uh, put it in the comment section of the Facebook Live on MCA's Facebook page right now. You have to call the radio station. So that question gets to me and I ask it for you. So again, talking with uh, MCA Grand Chief Abram Benedict. So uh, uh, Grand Chief, I noticed that the district meetings have uh, resumed uh, via Zoom. And can you tell me how that went? I think one of them was held already uh, for Gawanoge District, if I'm not mistaken. Um, How is that going? Uh, Did they get uh, anybody to attend? Yeah, so the last night, the Gawanoga District hosted their uh, first uh, district meeting since the pandemic has started. Um, community members who are interested in participating in that uh, session are asked to email meetings at aquasasne.ca and they'll be provided a link uh, to be able to zoom in to the, uh, the district meeting. As well, those people that don't have um, the Zoom system or access to a computer uh, can call our offices and we'll provide them with a phone number and then they'll enter in uh, a code uh, and they'll be able to phone into those those meetings as well and, and ask questions. So uh, the reports that I got back that it went well, uh, that, uh, you know, the people are managing and later this week, Jisnaine uh, uh, and Ganadigo will also be hosting their district meetings uh, using the Zoom platform. Have uh, have the, the chiefs, when you have your uh, Monday meetings, have you guys discussed in-person uh, meeting? Is that like months away? Is that a year away? Um, does that get discussed every time you guys meet? Yeah, so there have been some uh, different situations where we've discussed uh, meeting in person. You know, and, uh, you know, as I've gone through in my presentation, we haven't, we haven't achieved a high enough um, vaccine uh, uh, rate in our community yet and given that uh, you know we're the public health orders are still no gathering so we won't be having an in-person meeting just yet you know hopefully uh, if we continue on a track of uh, people uh, getting vaccinated receiving their second doses and becoming uh, you know fully vaccinated that hopefully by fall uh, the district meetings and in-person meetings can resume I can assure you though that you know when the pandemic first started, you know, we thought, oh, this is great. We can have Zoom meetings and uh, knock off five Zoom meetings in a day really quickly. But now that we're a year later, uh, you know, it's getting people, we need to interact with people. And uh, and that's in so many senses, not just in meetings, but at home and, and with our families. So that's why it's extremely important that uh, people, uh, you know, get out and get vaccinated, ensure that they're getting their vaccine um, within the 20, with 28 days after receiving the first one. But Believe me, Reen, as soon as we're able to, we want to be able to meet, be meeting in person. All right, so we have another food distribution uh, through the Mohawk Council of Aquazessi's Department of Community and Social Services Food Security Program. So they're having another distribution that'll take place on Thursday and Friday of this week. Uh, community members were asked to register uh, as of uh, last Friday. So um, if anybody has any questions on that, you can email food security at aquasase.ca. Um, is there any chance that uh, individuals that were not able to register by the deadline are able to uh, register still for uh, the two days of um, the food security program food distribution? Yes, absolutely. So I checked in this morning uh, and they are taking registrations uh, up until four o'clock today. So they will do they, that is a bi-weekly distribution. So every two weeks uh, and the boxes uh, this week will be distributed on Thursday. So if, if folks are uh, needing or wanting to uh, get some assistance with the food distribution, uh, they can give a call over to the distribution center and um, up until four o'clock today, and they'll be put on the list for uh, to receive one of them. Okay. Um, so again, you can call 613-936-1548, extension 1300. You can also email food security at aquasaste.ca. Deadline to register for that food distribution is today at 4 p.m. Now, speaking of food, Grand Chief, uh, we have something that uh, the Mohawk Council of Aquasaste has been running uh, for probably a few months now at least. 
It's the community and quarantine program. So we understand that the MCA had announced uh, last week about the community and quarantine program that people that were coming home from vacation and people that were coming home from, say, snowbirds from Florida or Arizona and whatnot were not able to utilize that program. And uh, looking at the program itself, wouldn't we want people to stay home and try and do everything we can as a government or as a community to make it easy for them to stay home? Uh, what was the cause for not allowing those individuals to uh, to be able to utilize that community and quarantine program? A great question, Lean. So we had a bit of back and forth on this and the community and quarantine project was designed for uh, individuals. It started with individuals uh, at the time uh, that had been exposed to uh, a case or had, had become positive, uh, you know, through exposure and that once they were exposed, they had to go home and quarantine immediately and therefore, you know, may not have had uh, groceries at home or, you know, the, the essentials uh, to be quarantined for uh, two weeks. So that was why the, uh, the, one of the reasons why the program was started, you know, I, as, uh, as you know, our community uh, continues to get vaccinated, we have heard of people uh, traveling about uh, as well as coming back from uh, different locations. When community members, uh, you know, go on vacation for a week, this requires, uh, you know, some um, coordination and planning to take, take place. Uh, travel is not an essential activity. Uh, vacation is not an essential activity. While we may, you know, arguably we need it uh, at this point, it's not, the, you know, we're still advising people need to be staying home. So therefore the decision was made that if, if people are uh, traveling and vacationing for a period of time outside of the community, meaning to Florida or what have you, they need to, con they need to take into consideration that they need to plan for the 14 day quarantine at home. And also as well uh, for snowbirds uh, that are returning back to the community, um, if they have families that can assist with ensuring that they have the proper uh, adequate supplies to uh, be at home for two weeks during quarantine, uh, we ask that they please do that. The program was designed for uh, people that have been exposed and were not, were not planning to be exposed. Of course, nobody plans to be exposed, but going on vacation uh, requires some planning. Okay, so uh, another question with regards to um, the uh, announcement by Ford last week for uh, the province of Ontario, uh, Premier Ford. Now, something that got people very uh, uh, upset, uh, we talked about fatigue and people are frustrated, we're overwhelmed, we're sick of it. So one of the big ones that, uh, that people picked out of everything he said was the fact that police would have the power to basically pull anybody over on the road for no just cause or, or, you know, anything just to see who they are and why they're not in their house. And um, people are very scared about that, um, the far reaching arm of law enforcement. So, um, you know, a few uh, uh, law enforcement uh, uh, agencies throughout Ontario kind of came out and said, you know, we're not going to do that. So regardless of what the premier said, uh, this, you know, we're, we don't have time to do that. Mm -hmm. So, um, with regards to the Yakuza Mohawk Police Service, just within the last hour, it was announced that they too will not be conducting random COVID nineteen traffic stops. Um, do you have any information on that, Grand Chief? Yeah. So last week, when the province of Ontario announced that they were uh, enforcing uh, stricter measures to keep the to keep the community safe and keep you know the uh, the COVID nineteen virus slow it down from spreading. As you mentioned, one of the uh, one of the things that was announced by the government was that uh, police could stop randomly to check and see if their travel was essential. Immediately, a number of police services across the province rejected that, and I think that you know they run into a lot of uh, challenges around that. Um, but if you recall, uh, back last year when um, the, the pandemic first started, a very similar measure was enacted uh, as well that gave the ability for uh, police services to do that as well. The same thing happened then was that uh, the uh, police services rejected that. In fact, in Ontario, the Premier, uh, the, the uh, Solicitor General uh, of Canada and the Premier walked back saying, uh, they took that back. They said that the, the police uh, will not have that authority and power to do that. In fact, most police services said they would not do it at all. So 
you know, it is a tool uh, that the government wanted police services to have. In our community, we have the community curfew as well. So we ask that people please abide by that. If people are out, uh, you know, out past 11 p.m. and don't have a reason, the, 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 the police services here, the Office of Municipal Police, uh, may pull them over and say, look, there's a community curfew. Why are you out and about? These are tools that are available for the police. Um, but the Mohawk Police Services has issued uh, a statement that they will not enforce that. But this past weekend, the, the, the government of Ontario said that uh, that will not be happening anywhere in the province. All right. So according to the release from the Aquasasta Mohawk Police Service, uh, like I said, it came through in the last hour or so. Um, they uh, included information with regards to some of the things that were talked about on Friday by Premier Ford. So there are exceptions to the restrictions. Um, with regards to travel, uh, regarding crossing provincial lines, including travel for essential purpose, for work, for medical care, transportation of goods, etc. Mm -hmm. Indigenous persons exercising treaty rights are also exempt. Mm -hmm. So looking at that uh, uh, portion, just that one line, Indigenous persons exercising treaty rights are also exempt. So does that mean that we're having to go hunting and fishing? Does that mean that, uh, you know, if we were to leave the province, we will be, um, you know, involved in that or um, can that be with regards to uh, to work and maybe um, say, for example, I make beaded earrings and I need to uh, to take them and meet someone uh, from another reserve. Is that covered in that? Is it covered if it's a family member? Mm -hmm. um, we have a number of uh, individuals that live on the territory that are from outside our community, either they're from Kaindanega or Gunawage, Gunasadage. Um, would those individuals be able to to cross the uh, line from Ontario into Quebec just to visit their loved ones? What do you know about Indigenous persons exercising treaty rights are also exempt? Yeah, so let's just talk a bit about the uh, about the uh, provincial boundary checkpoints. So as part of the measures that the, the province put in place is that they were establishing checkpoints for vehicles coming into the province of Ontario. And they essentially want to make sure that everybody coming into the into Ontario, whether it be from Quebec or Manitoba, are entering the, uh, the, the province for essential purposes and not leisure reasons. And of course, these measures are all about having to trying to keep the the, the province safe as well as slowing the spread. We do know that there are some hot spots across Ontario as well as outside of Ontario. One of the other things too though is, is that uh, there was a list of exemptions uh, announced at that time and those were uh, the traveling for uh, essential which is either work or see, uh, achieving medical uh, services or you know school and i think in our community uh, you know those uh, would likely be the medical and the school as well as what you've mentioned there is the uh, the right to to practice our aboriginal treaty rights is so if there are some hunters or gatherers going over the provincial lines to uh, to do that to do that uh, they will be allowed to pass. Now, I do know that speaking to individuals that have crossed over uh, since the, the, the checkpoint's been put in, they're not, uh, you know, they're not heavily scrutinizing. They're asking, what is your purpose? If you're traveling, I'm going on my way to the hospital. I'm on my way to uh, take care of a loved one. I'm on my way to work. You're essentially on your way. So when we, but also I want to remind folks as well, um, the, the, the Canada United States border continues to be closed as well. And if you'll recall that, um, you know, those exemptions that we have are so that we can pass for essential reasons as well. Now, you know, being in the community, um, you know, we cross through there all the time. Uh, that language is there for us to be able to continue to live our lives in the community that we live in that happens to be on the border and cross for essential reasons. Now, you know, I don't have to go into the details of how exam how much of an examination or how much they require you to justify that but those exemptions are there and there are still and very similarly there are those exemptions for crossing over into the Quebec portion it's just we have to remember that these have been put in place so people are not heading into downtown Montreal to do shopping the shopping is not an essential reason to do browsing around there well as much as we want to be able to go to other places and enjoy the nice weather take in a nice meal it's not the time right now unfortunately so that's why these measures have been put in place okay, talking with Mohawk Council of Aquasa State Grand Chief Abram Benedict he's providing his monthly update for uh, the jurisdiction of the Mohawk Council of Aquasa so I'm going to uh, get to some more questions here from our listeners, uh, Grand Chief. 
if all MCA employees receive the vaccine, then why is MCA closed to the community? Well, again, <clears throat> we, we don't have um, the exact accounting of all of our employees of whether or not they have received the vaccine. Receiving a vaccine, whether an employee or a community member is completely uh, your choice, each individual choice. I have talked to many people who will not get the vaccine. That is completely up to them. So we don't have a tabulation exactly on how many. While we do know how many have gotten it through the health services, we haven't equated that or translated that into employees at this point. Um, the uh, the other thing is is that while many have received some or the first shot, not everybody has received the second shot. As I said in my presentation, it takes uh, you know a number of uh, you know upwards of forty plus days before you're from your first shot to being fully vaccinated, provided that you receive the second shot on the twenty eighth day. So, you know we are taking abundance of caution because the other thing is that. Um, a lot of the cases, the new cases have been attributed to gatherings and workplace transmissions because we're, you know, in the workplace in which we are in, we become comfortable, we, you know, but it is not our, our, our bubble, part of our bubble. So having uh, people work from home and, and not having, uh, you know, the services open right now is just another measure being taken to protect ourselves and our community. We're just not there yet where we can be, uh, you know, back to some state of normal. Uh, the radio station in Malone reported that the Cornwall Community Hospital is at a level three. What does that mean for Aquazessa? So the level three, I mean, is uh, it just it it's, means that they're uh, you know they are at capacity level. They have a large number of, of folks in within the hospital that are receiving medical attention. Unfortunately, as I mentioned in the uh, in my presentation, uh, while somebody may be active uh, for COVID-19 uh, with the variant are seeing that people need medical attention way past the point of the two weeks where they're considered active, which means that the hospital is being over uh, you know, over capacity, they are having a challenging time to uh, take care of everybody. Um, but at the same time, they have assured us and continue to let the community know, if you do need medical assistance, please go, you know, please don't hesitate. They're, they're, the emergency rooms are open. There's just additional precautions being taken. Visit, visits are being uh, restricted because of it. As well, I'd like to also uh, inform the community that when the new directives came in place uh, around the uh, around um, the new restrictions, there was also a number of health directives that were given to the hospitals. And one of them is that um, they no longer need patient consent to transfer uh, people out of the hospital. So the Cornell Community Hospital is transferring patients who are not uh, acute or have that high need of medical attention but need to be hospitalized. They are transferring those patients to other local hospitals to be able to balance out the influx of uh, patients coming in. So the, we need to be aware of that as well, that that, that could happen. Hopefully it does not. Uh, but of course, this is all about flattening the curve and ensuring that you know we slow down the curve to help preserve the, the healthcare system that our community and the communities around us uh, really need. What is the total number of people vaccinated in MCA's jurisdiction? As reported in my presentation, we're around 1,000, we've administered around 1,200 uh, vaccines at this point. That is the ones that we have administered. As, uh, as I reported, the St. Regis Mohawk tribe has, in, has administered a well, as well a number of uh, vaccines to uh, people in, in our community uh, under the jurisdiction of the Mohawk Council. We haven't had a chance at this point to, to put the exact tabulation on there. I know that the St. Mohawk tribe is reporting around 42% of the community has been immunized. Uh, we, we don't have a baseline as of yet, but we are working on that so that we can report that back to the community. And uh, when will MCA start providing current information as a community member start receiving real statistical information? like the number of daily COVID tests, number of daily COVID cases, and number of daily COVID vaccines. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, well, we do put out the regular reports that do provide the uh, current active cases, the new active cases, as well, I believe that the uh, number of tests is administered on there, which is what, what is not being reported right now is the number of vaccines administered. And I will take that back to the health staff to see that we can uh, report how many vaccines have been provided as well. 
Uh, will the COVID vaccine continue to be a choice or will it become a requirement? And the second part of that question, will those with religious or other beliefs still be able to choose to not be vaccinated? And this is within the MCA and B organization. Mm -hmm. I believe we had this uh, question as well last month. <clears throat> the, uh, to, the, um, there is no requirement at this point to receive a COVID-19 vaccine. Whether or not we will get there, uh, likely not. Um, there has been no uh, discussions in, in any of, the, uh, in any of the, the tables that I sit at about making it mandatory for the schools. Um, as an employer or the Mohawk Council of Sustain, um, you know we don't uh, we don't make those things required as well. I don't for I don't see in the in the in the near future that being required. It still is uh, every community member's uh, individual choice of whether or not they want to be vaccinated. All right, what is being done in Saint about non-natives going to the dispensaries? Mm -hmm. They see it every day. Mm -hmm. Well, we, this has been a conversation, an influx of uh, vehicles coming into the village for what, what have you, what purposes there may be. We are asking the police services to continue to enforce the speeding um, and speeding laws that exist uh, so that uh, continue to keep the community safe. We, uh, the police services do not, unless the person is breaking the law, does not uh, enforce the uh, customs uh, customs uh, requirements that exist there. Uh, but if anybody is caught breaking the law that is not from our community and is not uh, from uh, this, the Northern portion and is non-Indigenous, uh, they could be facing some repercussions for that. So we will continue to have the police, uh, ask the police to uh, enforce the uh, speeding uh, requirements. I will say as well at the last uh, council meeting, which uh, again, I always thank you to Reen for reporting that we had a discussion around stop signs in the village as well. There have been a couple requests that have come in for the placement of new stop signs to help slow down and facilitate traffic. So that is a conversation we are having and we will likely see some actions coming out of that in the very near future to be able to uh, slow down the traffic in, in the village here. Will MCA be offering an increase in payments like Ontario? Um, I'm not exactly sure on which uh, payments they're re referencing it in the question. I'm not sure either. Um, so I don't we'll, think... Uh, I'm not sure what uh, payments Ontario has increased at this point. The federal government did just announce uh, their latest budget, which uh, which sets out a road plan for their initiatives and spending in the coming years or immediately. Uh, that that budget is has made significant investments in various areas within uh, Indigenous communities, uh, including uh, child uh, child care as well as uh, early learning. Uh, missing and murdering Indigenous women and girls. Um, so we will be seeing some additional investments through there, including, uh, you know, um, additional COVID measures. Um, so that's the only ones that I'm aware of right now. Any other uh, increases in Ontario, I, I, I can't speak to at this point. Okay. Um, now, with regards to the budget, uh, we've referenced it a couple of times um, for the Canadian federal budget. Um, they announced uh, an increase on tobacco uh, $4 uh, a carton. Um, now, for people that don't understand the budget process or aren't familiar with it, I know they just put that information out there. How does that work, uh, Grand Chief, with regards to, you know, is this something that they're, they're voting on or how long of a process is this where you will see the budget get passed, uh, you know, whether it includes these things or not? What kind of process is that? Yeah, so the budget process um, sets a, a framework and a road path for moving forward financially and under initiatives and priorities of the government. They will say that they've invested, you know, 30, 30 billion dollars over a five year period, which, you know, can be broken down in incremental. So it doesn't mean 30 will start now. As well, uh, through this process, uh, it is required that the government, the House, uh, the Parliament uh, approve the spending bill, which requires uh, that all parties um, have, well, not all parties, but they have to have majority of the House approve. And under currently under this current government, it's not a, what they call a majority. So they don't have enough votes uh, to pass bills on their own, which means they need another party to support, whether it be the Conservatives, the NDP, or the Green Party. Uh, 
So what will happen over the next couple of weeks is that uh, the uh, other parties will make submissions and ask for variances or ask for things to be changed within the budget. Uh, and if they achieve what they've asked for, then they'll support it. If they don't achieve it, then uh, then they likely won't support it. But at this point, the NDP has said that they will support this budget. So within the next couple of weeks, we will likely see that this budget will be approved uh, for implementation. It will then take several months uh, for the uh, the changes or the new investments to to take place. Mind you, the government uh, will likely uh, take their summer break uh, in the next coming weeks. So in the fall, we'll see some of the changes. There could be some initial uh, immediate changes that could happen, whether it be in the healthcare, or sorry, not in healthcare, in the childcare sector, or there, there may be some increases in, uh, in child tax credits, et cetera. Um, the budget is, is just announced. It's a massive document, 700 some odd pages of uh, what wow. they're planning on doing. Um, it has to go through the legislative process. So within the next couple of weeks, we will see whether what will change and what will, what will be implemented and what will not be. All right, uh, the payments that I was asking about, they called back. The payments that they're asking about are from community support. So um, uh, uh, community support payments. Okay. So will MCA be offering an increase in community support payments like the province of Ontario is doing? Mm -hmm. So we have, uh, through the community support program, there have been, I believe, two uh, additional um, increases that have been given a certain a set dollar amount I don't I don't recall the amount, the amount off hand but a, a few hundred dollars have been given to each additional recipient as of right now I'm not I'm not aware of any new ones coming out so it's happened twice so far uh, there could be some new ones with the, the new uh, the new budget coming down but uh, we will have to uh, follow up uh, follow up on that and find out what uh, some increases may be. All right, so what we're gonna do uh, is uh, close down the program at the latest uh, about 110, 115. So just to let people know. Uh, continuing through the questions, why is MCA following the Ontario closures for the offices, but AMBI is not following the Ontario rules? So the, the, uh, we don't have a public health uh, act in our community, and nor do we have a, an emergencies act in, in, in our community like the federal government and the provincial government have. I know that um, <clears throat> there have been enough questions asked, uh, or a few questions asked around why the schools uh, have reopened during a, close, a closure. I think there's a couple of things that we need to consider. Um, the uh, Sustainwalk, um, Mohawk Board of Education works closely with the MCA Health Department as well as the East Ontario Health Unit and monitors the uh, cases in the community regularly. Um, the, the model that we have been using uh, in our school is a hybrid, which means that the students are in two days in the classroom and two days at home, and that's a rotating schedule as well. Uh, the uh, the total uh, cap on the class sizes in our, in our, in our schools is 10. Um, whereas when we look at the provincial model, um, the schools in the province of Ontario have been open since September. Some have closed for two weeks, but not, they haven't, there hasn't been a total closure. Our schools in, in our community have been closed since uh, November 1st, around, around, around Halloween, and have been operating online since then. So now that we're, we're looking at bringing back the high, well, we have brought back the hybrid model where there's an opening, we'll continue to work with the health services, uh, uh, the MCA health services, continue to monitor the cases around us. Uh, mind you, the, uh, the, the schools in, uh, in the states uh, have been open as well. So Salmon River and Mohawk School continue to be open. We have seen, uh, unfortunately, you know, cases in our school where students uh, are not coming online and are, there is going to be some significant academic impact to our children, uh, you know, uh, going forward and taking a look at the current health uh, status of the community, seeing what the caseloads were at, discussing with Eastern Ontario Health Unit, discussing with the MCA Health Department, they made a decision that they would go uh, back to in-class under the hybrid model and starting last week. Going forward, they will continue to monitor uh, all of the, uh, the case loads. I can tell you that there is a significant number of students who as well are on strictly online as well. So there is, a, there is some that choose to go in school two days a week, 
there are some that choose to be all online. Uh, so the numbers are significantly reduced in the classrooms. All of the health uh, measures are in place, are, are in, this, in the classes, in the school itself. There are protective shields between the students. Everybody has to wear masks or shield uh, at, uh, at all times when in classroom. Um, the social distancing continues to apply. So all the measures are being taken, are taken place uh, to keep the, the staff and, and the students um, safe. I will also say uh, we, uh, on that is that um, the Board of Education has asked their employees to identify if they have been uh, vaccinated and a very large number of the staff of the Upsustom Board, Board of Education, the teachers have been vaccinated. You'll know that if you watch the news in Ontario, that the teachers in the last couple of weeks in Ontario were saying, why are we not being vaccinated? So there was no directive in Ontario that teachers would be a priority to be vaccinated. In our community, uh, because we do our own vaccination, we have made the teachers a priority. So there are different, there are a few different uh, optics that we need to consider. And these are all the things that the Board of Education takes into consideration when they've made that decision. Does MCA still do contact tracing? Two of my family members have COVID and no one has been contacted. Okay, well, yes, that's, that's not a good situation. If there is somebody who has not been contacted and knows that they have been um, in direct contact with the case or has tested positive, they should be calling over to the community health uh, program. But yes, our uh, community health program does our own contact tracing and they do all the follow up calls. So I ask that they please uh, call the health services and uh, have a conversation with them about what is going on. Why are kids still in childcare centers if everyone is trying to be careful? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the childcare centers as well, uh, a large number of the um, of the, um, the staff at the child care have been vaccinated as well. Uh, we Again, they are under, the child care is now under the Oxostemoc Board of Education. So they have asked their staff to self-identify who has been vaccinated. Um, those parents that uh, have been working and have younger children in child care know that the pandemic has been extremely difficult for, well, in general for all of us, but as for parents that need child care to, for their parents to be able to work has been extremely difficult as well. So the, uh, the, the child care has been operating for a number of uh, months now. They had shut down, which was had a very, uh, you know, hard impact on families, uh, but they have been operating at reduced levels and operating for uh, essential workers, uh, Oh, children of essential workers were, were the ones that they were servicing. So this continues to be uh, monitored as well, uh, but uh, the service is greatly needed. Um, the, uh, the staff and all, uh, you know, PPE and uh, protective equipment is used uh, to make sure that everybody is kept safe as much as possible in those situations. But again, this is, a, a, is an area as well that they continue to monitor and uh, check in to make sure that uh, there are no cases or that everybody is uh, being uh, as safe as possible. All right, so uh, what kind of measures are to be put forth for fully vaccinated people who have been in contact with someone who is infected with COVID-19 mm -hmm. will still have to quarantine? As of right now, it is a yes. And I know that uh, we have been getting a lot of questions from folks who have received both of their vaccines and saying, well, I have both of my uh, vaccines. It's been the 42 days or it's been several weeks now. You know, can I travel? Can I not quarantine when coming back? What happens exactly in a situation that you are, you are describing if they were in contact with somebody? The vaccine uh, lowers your chances of getting the, the virus, but it is not 100% effective. There still is a risk of you getting, getting the, uh, getting, contacting, contracting the virus if you're vaccinated. As of right now, the same uh, requirements of uh, being vaccinated or not being vaccinated continue to apply. So if you were in an exposure case, you need to uh, uh, quarantine for the 14 days. As well, the same directives for traveling continue to apply for the time being. If you were vaccinated for uh, getting your first and second shot, you still need to quarantine even if you have that and you want to travel outside of the community. 
All right. Why do people on disability get an extra COVID payment? And this elder who called in didn't get anything. Okay. Um, it seems as though there must be some um, things or some additional resources that the Ontario government may has rolled out uh, through through uh, the last couple of weeks. We'll have to follow up on that and find out. I don't know in this situation if the elder is on a uh, pension or if they are on disability. So there are a couple of factors that uh, we'll have to work through, but if they want to give my office call or one of the district chiefs a call, we can take the information and we can follow up and find out. All right, so with regards to the vaccines, uh, AstraZeneca and Johnson and Johnson, uh, Moderna and Pfizer, uh, we get the Moderna vaccine uh, for MPA. Yes. So will we be getting the Moderna vaccine this whole way through? Yes, we have been assured that we'll have enough vaccines uh, from the province of Ontario to vaccinate our entire community. As well, uh, working with Eastern Ontario Health Unit, there is an opportunity for us to exchange some vaccines for the vaccines they have, specifically uh, giving them some Moderna to get some Pfizer back. And the Pfizer, uh, the reason why we would get that back would be is that uh, it's allowed for 16 and over, whereas the Moderna is not. So there is there is some ability to move that around a little bit right now, uh, but we're just, um, for the current time, we're just providing uh, Moderna to the community. Okay. Um, so uh, at the Ottawa Lagoa Arena, over the weekend, you had the walk-in vaccine clinics. Uh, Ambi provided bus transportation. Mm -hmm. Is that going to be the case going forward? How is that going to work? Is that going to uh, depend on you know what day of the week and and where? Um, how will Ambi transportation uh, work into it uh, for the walk-in vaccine clinic? So the, the vaccine clinics that have been announced uh, are in the coming days. I don't know if there will be bus services provided for them. But I can say that if they are not for this, uh, these upcoming clinics, there will be bus services provided for future ones. We want to make sure that all the community members uh, that want to get the vaccine are getting the vaccine. And if they are challenged by having to And looks like the uh, Mohawk Council of Aquasastia Grand Chief uh, has some technical uh, difficulties right now. And uh, while we're waiting for him to, uh, to uh, resume, we do have um, some information with regards to MCA's Department of Community and Social Services Food Security Program, uh, reminding the community that the next distribution for MCA's Department of Community and Social Services Food Security Program uh, that uh, that's going to take place on Thursday, April 22nd. And I believe they're also going to look at distributing on Friday as well. So community members uh, that um, are asked to please uh, uh, register by four o'clock today. So they have uh, um, uh, taken the deadline and moved it to today. It was supposed to be as of last Friday. So as of four o'clock today, that's when the MCA Department of Community and Social Services Food Security Program will need you to register uh, for the uh, uh, food distribution through that uh, program on Thursday of this week. Now, if you'd like to register for that, you can give them a call at 613-936-1548, 613-936-1548, extension 1300. And you can also email foodsecurity at aquazaste.ca. And we'll also let you know for the upcoming clinics as a community uh, for the uh, Mohawk Council of Aquazaste, um, just covering the, uh, the clinics for you, Grand Chief. Uh, we have the upcoming vaccine clinics open to the community without an appointment. So this is a walk-in. Wednesday, April 21st, Ganadago Recreation, 2.30 to 6 p.m. Friday, April 23rd at Nomalagoa Arena, 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Saturday, April 24th, Snye Recreation, noon to 3 p.m. So those are the upcoming walk-in vaccination clinics for the uh, Mohawk Council of Aquazaste. So uh, Grand Chief, uh, uh, looks like we're going to be uh, wrapping up uh, today's program.
Yeah, my apologies uh, for that. I mean, obviously, as you know, uh, being remote and having to work on all this uh, great technology that we have that we love so much, it doesn't always, it's not always perfect. But so thank you very much for uh, covering that. And uh, as always, thank you for uh, taking some time this afternoon to uh, allow me to update the community and answer some questions that the community may have. If there is anything that we haven't covered uh, this afternoon, uh, please reach out to myself or members of council to, uh, to ask or inquire about, uh, you know, whether it be around the pandemic or uh, about other community issues. As we mentioned, the uh, district meetings are uh, starting, have started back up. Uh, Ganadigo, has, uh, Ganadigo and Justina have theirs coming up as well as uh, um, Goanoga had theirs last night. So I encourage uh, members to, uh, to to uh, zoom in to those meetings and uh, receive information and ask questions. But so Reen, as always, thank you very much. This uh, global pandemic has been, uh, has been extremely tiring for everyone. And, and unfortunately, while we're currently doing some really good work, uh, we have to continue to uh, keep moving forward and, and uh, roll out our vaccines here in the community. It's not over yet. It's extremely important that uh, those of you that uh, are wanting to get your vaccines to reach out and uh, make the appointment or come to the walk-ins that Reen has, uh, has reported for us. Or if you're waiting for your second shot, please do not uh, fail to, uh, to get the second shot done. First shot is not enough. We need everybody to be fully vaccinated. We will continue to uh, take this one day at a time as this, uh, you know, it is continuously changing around us, uh, the restrictions, the allowables, the, uh, you know, the uh, supports uh, continue to change uh, every day, every week as we move along. But, so we must continue to exercise patience. But as always, thank you very much, Reen, for spending time with me this afternoon. Yamagoa to the community, Yamagoa to all of our employees for the work that they're doing to keep our community safe and uh, hopefully we'll uh, touch base in about a month or so and update you uh, again and let you know where we're at. And hopefully we'll have some uh, better numbers of being vaccinated and uh, see some restrictions being lifted so that we can enjoy this beautiful weather uh, that we know is coming very soon. So Yamagoa, Reen. Yamagoa, Grand Chief uh, Abram Benedict, Mohawk Council of Aquazaste. Stay safe, Grand Chief. Ona. Ona, Reen.